So thanks for coming out. Tonight's going to be session number five, and uh, the title is Revealing the Unknown God. It's two parts tonight and next Wednesday night, and uh, Revealing the Unknown God. And you'll understand in just a minute why that's the title. Let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you for your word, and I pray, Father, that your word will be real, and that we'll understand the application of your word in the culture in which we live. For many have rejected the word, many do not know the word. So how do we communicate this truth to those who have no foundation? And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us in this task in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you say that people are responding to the gospel today as they did 50 years ago? <laughs> Why? Let me rephrase the question. When I preach today, do the people I'm talking to have the same foundation that the listeners had when preachers preached 50 years ago? Before you answer that question, uh, let me review my foundation. I'm 62 years old. So when I say 50 years ago, it's a relevant question. Let me review my foundation. I went to school where the Bible was read out loud every day. And prayer in Jesus' name was not unusual. It was just, that's what you did. I was raised up with Genesis as my foundation. Literally. I never heard of evolution monkeys, so they weren't in my foundation. I, I didn't have that worldview. I did not see the world through those eyes. Because my foundation created a set of lenses in which I saw life itself. I saw the biblical origin of man, of creation, Adam and Eve. I saw all of that. Now, I want you to think about the high schoolers today. Do they have the same foundation as Terry Cooper? No. And again, let's just let's face reality. Okay, let's face reality. They do not have that same foundation. Those formidable years for them were different than they were for me. Has the message of the gospel of Christ changed? No. In fact, I've, I've often thought kind of with some laughter that we're preaching the same thing that they've been preaching for 2,000 years. We haven't changed anything. It's the same message. But here's the question. Can I preach the same way to this culture that the preachers did 50 years ago? No. Why? And a lot of you probably are struggling right now with me saying that, but, but please listen to me. Can I preach the same way to this culture today that preachers did 50 years ago? No, I can't. And when I say this culture, I'm talking about the younger generation, those coming up those much younger than me. It's the same message, yes. The same method, no. Why? I cannot tell somebody the end of the story without them knowing the beginning of the story. Do you grab a book and read it and only read the end and say, that was really good? It would be foolish, right? So I grew up in a New Testament Christian church. You know what they taught? New Testament. Only time we went to the Old Testament is when they want to tell you a Bible story. We went back to Daniel, and I found out about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and the lion's den. I didn't know anything about any of the other stuff, which I'm kind of upset about now later in life, but I'm working on that. But you know what we dealt with? New Testament. You know why it worked? Because we all had the same starting point. Everybody in that church had the same starting point. You didn't have to tell me about Genesis and Adam and Eve because I already knew about Genesis and Adam and Eve. You didn't have to recreate the beginning of the story. But what about today? What about this generation of high schoolers coming up? Is it different? You see, the youth today don't have the same starting point. They don't have the same foundation that I did. Our public education system has taken care of that for us. Now, if they'd have stayed in a good church, we might have been able to counteract that. But it, the, the, the sad thing is many of the churches even started going along 
with the educational system doctrine. Given up on the idea that the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis happened to actually be real. The origin of man, the origin of creation. This is where Ken Ham is going tonight in the video, and I'm going to set it up. The Apostle Paul preached to both of these types of cultures in his day, but it was different than what I'm applying right now. Let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul, what did he do when he would go to any town? He would go to a Jewish synagogue. So who do you think he's going to talk to in Jewish synagogues? Jews. Did the Jewish synagogue, Jewish people, struggle with the book of Genesis? They loved the book of Genesis. They loved it. Why? It's their history book. So when Paul would preach to the Jews, he could preach kind of without having to deal with the origins. He could move on to other things because they understood it. <coughs> the Jews and the... But, but could he do that when he went when he got kicked out of the synagogue because they rejected Christ and he went out to the Gentiles, could he just tell them the end of the story? Could he just tell them, you all need to repent of your sins? Why? You just need to repent of your sins. Why? Well, sin brings death. Why? If you didn't read Genesis, you couldn't answer any of those questions. It just sounded like some, another nut somewhere telling you something you didn't want to do. You see, the Jews and the Gentiles, like all of mankind today, are all looking for purpose and meaning in life, fulfillment, heaven, something that's worth living for. But the question is, how do I get there? Ever, who doesn't want to have hope, right? Who doesn't want to have a future? It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, live then or live today. But how do I get to that place? How do I get to the place of hope? Something to believe in. 1 Corinthians one twenty three says this. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, well, let's stop there. Why do I preach Christ crucified? Because his crucifixion is the forgiveness of your sins. Why? Where does sin come from? You see, you can't just go to the end. If you just go to the end, we preach Christ crucified. Well, that might work for Jews, and that might work for people my age who were raised in the church. But what if you weren't Jewish, and you, you didn't accept Genesis as reality? And what if, what if you lived in a different time than me, and you never heard the story about Adam and Eve, except in comic book characters? We preach Christ crucified. And what's the result? I find this verse phenomenal, by the way. And what's the result? The Jews are offended. Now, if you read the NIV, it says the Jews consider Christ crucified, the gospel, a stumbling block. Which means what? They trip over it. They're trying to get to heaven, and then here comes Paul, a Jew, and says to get to heaven, you got to go over Jesus. So you know what they do? They trip on him. Rather than stand upon him and receive the gospel, they fall over top of him and don't go anywhere. But what about the Gentiles? The Gentiles say it's nonsense, foolishness. But it's the same message. One group, the Jews, if they reject Jesus, they say what? I'm offended by the fact that you tell me that, there, that Jesus is the only way. Because, see, they didn't identify Jesus as their Messiah. They didn't believe he was who he said he was. And the Gentiles, what did they say? This is all nonsense. We all today preach Christ crucified. It is the core of the gospel. But to some it is offensive, and to others it is foolishness. That part has not changed. To some people it is offensive. It makes them mad. To some people it's just your simpleton. It's foolishness. So let me ask you two questions. Did the Jews believe in God? Yes. But they stumbled over. They stumbled over and were offended by Jesus because he says he's the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And if you don't believe he's the only way, truth, and the life, and he stands in front of you between you and heaven, you're going to trip over him because you can't go around him. You're going to trip over him. 
He's a stumbling block. But what about did the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, believe in God? Which God? You see, Paul didn't have that battle with the Jews. They believed in Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But when he goes over to the Gentiles and he uses the word God, the first thing they're going to think is, well, which one? Because there's a bunch of them, right? There's all kinds of gods. To them, the whole thing is foolish nonsense. Because both to Jews and to Gentiles, the gospel is singular. Christ crucified. One man, one way, one truth, one life. One group had the foundation or beginning in Genesis. That would be the Jews. The other group had no concept of the foundation, which made Jesus and the whole thing, the message of Christ crucified, foolish nonsense. Now here's where I must acknowledge, and the more I studied this this past week, I need to stop and say something. I must acknowledge the working power of the Holy Spirit in my life. When I look back at the sermons that I have preached over the last 26 years of my ministry, I am amazed at one thing. Because I can look back over time at the methods that I used to communicate Christ crucified. God knew. I didn't know. I'll tell you. I'm not going to take credit for that. God knew that I would need to preach in a day that many would not have the Old Testament background and understand the New Testament if I preached it by itself like most preachers did when I was a kid. And God knew it. So you know what? When I look back at the 26 years of my ministry, there's something I always did, and I never knew why I was doing it. I'd like to take credit for it, but I didn't know. Every time I preached, I noticed that I connected the dots to the Old Testament. I still do it. I don't even try to do it. I just, that's what happens. And, and God knew that. So when he called me and he gave me the Holy Spirit to do this, he gave me this ability to do what this generation needed. They've got to be able to see the beginning before they will ever understand the end. They've got to be able to see why you need to turn from your sin. And if you reject Genesis, you'll never know why some preacher looks you in the eye today and says, repent. It'll just make you mad. You'll be offended. It's foolishness. You're going to hear Ken Ham talk about two things tonight. He's going to call it an Acts 2 culture and an Acts 17 culture. Now, I want to tell you what that is so that when you see the video, you're going to be able to stay with him. Acts 2 was Peter on the day of Pentecost talking to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And when he starts talking to them, if you read his sermon, they're Jewish people in Jerusalem for the Jewish feast of Pentecost. He does not have to tell them about Genesis. He doesn't need to do it. You know why? Because they all know about Genesis. You know what he needs to tell them? He can start his sermon in a whole different place. Right? Because they, they know that. He doesn't need to argue with them that there's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's an Acts 2 culture, and that's who he's talking to. But there's an Acts 17 culture. Now it's not Peter preaching in Jerusalem. It's the Apostle Paul preaching where? In Athens, Greece. Now, I'm going to ask you, do you think the people in Athens, Greece, understood the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Nope. What did Paul find when he got to Athens? There are idols all over the city. Idolatries everywhere. This temple of Athena was there. The goddess and, and the god Zeus and all those um, Greek mythology things. That's what they, how many gods? I don't even know how many gods they had. Not a singular God of Genesis, not the singular creator of Adam, none of that. So can he use, can Paul go into Athens and use the same sermon that Peter preached in Jerusalem? No. And that brings us to today. What if this generation coming up doesn't accept or know our beginnings? 
you'll have to take them to the beginning. You're going to have to show them the beginning. Is the gospel the same? Yes, yeah, it is. The gospel's the same. Is the presentation the same? No. In Acts 2 and in Acts 17, is the gospel message, Christ crucified? Yeah, he's in the middle. He's the, he's the material. But how do you get to Christ crucified? Well, I gotta take, you got to take the Gentiles or those who have rejected the origins of man a little different route than you do those who accept the origins of man as true. When I preach here on Sunday, I have a problem. I've got both types of people in the same room. You know what I consider one of my biggest challenges? That. Why? On Sunday when there's eight, nine hundred people in here in two services, I got both types. I got people in the room who accept Genesis as I accept Genesis. The origin of man, the origin of the universe, the origin of everything. Anything, anything that was made that has been made was made by God. Genesis reveals its origin. But in that same room, at the same time I'm talking, there are people sitting in that audience. And don't, don't doubt this, because I'm going to prove to you that this is true. I got people who reject the idea of Genesis creation, that God made everyone from one man. By the way, if you go back to Paul's sermon in Athens, what the core of his sermon was that from one man, God made all men and gave them the exact time and the location, not just time, but the geographical location where they would live. That God did all of that from one man, from one man. Now I realize that when I say I believe in the literal Genesis account of creation, some people, I, when, I, when I say that on Sunday morning, I know some people are going to say in their hearts this is foolishness. In fact, it, uh, um, to try not to get in trouble with this one, um, this was probably about a year ago I preached a sermon and I just casually, well, I wasn't even making a point out of it, uh, kind of made fun of evolutionary thinking as if we all came from monkeys. I told some kind of silly joke, which I do sometimes. And, and I got an email that week from somebody and says he thought I was an idiot and, and said that you should apologize. That I should apologize because... I insulted the people in the room who do not accept my view of Genesis. I don't really remember apologizing, but that's another story. <laughs> but I have to be, you and I have to be sensitive to that. Not sensitive that you're going to apologize for believing in Genesis. That's not my point. But if I want to reach that guy. I want to reach that guy. I don't want to run him off. I don't want to make him mad. I'm not trying to offend him. I want to reach him. So I want to tell him the truth about Genesis. Why? Is, is the truth about Genesis going to save him? No. Listen, no. But Genesis will open his mind to the reason why he needs Jesus. Because in Genesis, there wasn't any death. Do you get it? There wasn't any death. Adam and Eve had eternal flesh. They were not ever going to die. And then something entered our world. Sin. And sin is an infection that leads to death. It's, it's, it's a mortal disease. You die from it. And we all got it because we all came from the one who got it. And, and there was a time when man didn't have to die. And, and if you don't get that, you're probably never going to understand it when a preacher stands, stands up and say, repent of your sins and turn to God. Well, why? So you don't have to die. It's the cure of death itself. By the way, Jesus is, it is the foundation of Genesis, the Gospels, and Revelation. I want you to look at the 
if the, if the Word of God is this bookcase with all these books in it, Jesus is the foundation of Genesis. He is the foundation of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He is the foundation of Revelation. He, he's, not, he's the foundation of all of it. Don't, don't misunderstand. But he is the origin of all of them. By the way, let, let me prove it to you. In Genesis, read those first few chapters in the six-day creation. What? what? How, how did God do it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How? And he brought in earth movers from other galaxies and bulldozers. And how? How do you do it? How do you do it? This is really important. How do you do it? He spoke. The word. So what's creating in Genesis? What's creating in Genesis? Bulldozers? No. What? what? The Word. Okay, stay with me. Genesis, what's creating? The Word. Go to the beginning of the Gospels. The Gospel of John. First verse. What? In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So what's happening in Genesis? The Word is creating. What's happening in John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him, for Him, and through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. Is that confusing? Now, now let's go to the last one, my favorite, Revelation. When He comes back, He's going to be on a white horse. And what's His name? And His name is written. What's His name? Come on, if you've been here very long, surely you know his name. The Word of God. You can't make this up. Right? So, is the Genesis one important? It's important. It's important. I can't just jump to, he's on a white horse and his name's the Word of God. They're going to say, you're a nut. You're a nut. But if you can see the whole story, read the whole book then maybe I'm not a nut. You will fully understand. You will never, 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 never fully understand the Jesus of the Gospels until you see him as the foundation and the origin of Genesis. Ephesians 2.19. So now, you Gentiles, that's us, are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with all God's holy people. What's that mean? Gentiles and Jews, y'all can get together and have the same father, right? Whoa, have the same father, be in the same family. You're no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with all God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on what? Huh? This house built on what? Built on the foundation of two things, the apostles and the prophets. Guess where that comes from? The apostles, that's New Testament. The prophets, that's Old Testament. So what holds those two together? The apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. What holds the apostles and the prophets together? The cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Notice he said apostles and prophets. Genesis reveals the origins of man, all creation. Israel in the Old Testament, that's, how, that's the word you got from the prophets. Israel revealed the first coming of Jesus the Messiah. The Gospels, let's go to the New Testament. The Gospels reveal the life of Christ and his death on the cross. The book of Acts reveals the birth of the church which is going to reveal what? The second coming in Jesus. And by the way, the rest of the material after that all deals with a common thing. You know what it is? He's coming back. It's in there. Ken Ham tonight is going to use the word eschatology. So I'm going to prepare you for it. Some of y'all say he talks so fast I can't even listen to him anyway. That's why there's words up there. Read real fast. He does talk fast. And tonight he's going to introduce a word. I don't want to play the video until you hear the word and know what the word is. Eschatology. It is the study of end time events. By the way, he's going to give you three options that will be clear, uh, called out in the video. Amillennial, premillennial, and postmillennial. And in case you're wondering, I'm premillennial. You know what that means? Probably most of you don't. 
Premillennial simply means that it's, by, by the way, let me say this. Premillennial, which probably is not going to surprise you, is the most literal interpretation of the three. Premillennial means that we believe that Jesus will come before the thousand year reign. That Jesus will come. The coming of Christ is before the millennium, which is a thousand, which is the thousand years that we will reign with him on this present earth. And by the way, the Bible in Revelation clearly says, and we will reign with him on the present earth for a thousand years in new glorified bodies. So I'm premillennial. You know why? Because that's what the Bible says. I take it. But there's some that are amillennial. The word ah means no. They don't believe in any millennial. They don't believe there's ever going to be a thousand year reign of Christ on this present earth. They don't believe Jesus is ever going to come back to this present earth. There's going to be a big whoosh one day and everybody either goes to heaven or hell. All millennial. That's what all millennials believe. Post millennials, I can't even comprehend what they believe. You know what post millennials believe? They believe that right now you're living in the millennial reign of Christ. If that's true, I am one disappointed guy. I am. I vote for being disappointed. Because you know what that means? I don't even know what that means. So I don't even know how I'm going to tell you what that means. I'm a premillennialist. I take the literal interpretation of Scripture whenever I can. So you're going to hear that. That is eschatology. Here we go. Ken Ham. It's about 25 minutes long. Let's fire that up. I got one last question. And it's based on something in there, and I've seen it, we've talked about it, debated it on our staff and our leadership. Is he said two thirds of the the high school to college age when they graduate high school, go to college, two thirds of them never come back. We're losing the culture. They're going out into the dark. So I'm going to ask you this question. It's in the notes. Is it too late for our culture? Have we fallen too far? Because everybody wants to know. I can't stand up here tonight and say I know the answer to that because I don't. Uh, I have an opinion. And the opinion is it's, it's, it's gone too far. That the culture itself as a whole, barring some great revival awakening event, it's, it's gone too far to swing back. Will there be many saved? Yeah, I'm convinced there will be many saved. But as a culture, as a culture, as a whole, is it too late? I don't know. That's up to God. It's not, that's above my pay scale. But I have to believe that it's swing too far. And I'm not just using just my intellect. I, I, I've read the Old Testament. I, I've watched what happened in Israel. That when God's judgment came is when, um, when they reached a point to where there were so many more in idolatry and so many more when even the leadership of even, even even the Jewish religion leadership had abandoned God. He brought judgment. He didn't bring a revival. He brought judgment. He scattered them. Ran them all. So northern, northern kingdom, bring the Assyrians, destroy them. Southern kingdom, bring the Babylonians, destroy them. And it was two things, two things, two things. Over and over and over. I have studied this book for 25 years. Two things. Idolatry and the shedding of innocent blood. And when it reached a point, a breaking point, he said, I'm done. Idolatry, shedding of innocent blood. Does America got an issue? Stick your head in the sand if you want to. But So that's really not my closing point. My closing point is this. Some things have to happen. Stay with me. Some things have to happen. You can't stop it. 
You know what? It's been prophesied. There's a series of events that have been in advance prophesied. They've got to happen. They're going to happen. It don't matter whether you like it or not. It's going to happen. I'm going to give you an example. Jesus is walking to Jerusalem, and he's told his apostles that the Son of Man's going to be, be taken in by these sinful leaders. He'll be crucified, and on the third day, rise again. And what's Peter do? You've got to love Peter. Peter steps out and says, oh, Lord, no, 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 you don't get it. We don't do that. See, Jesus has already said that it's, it, these, there's some things that have to happen. God has ordained certain events to take place. So he tells them. You know, he gives them the heads up. I'm going to tell you the future. The future is the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, crucified on the third day, rise again. And Peter says, oh, not on my watch. <laughs> Not while I'm here. And what did Jesus say? What did he say? Get behind me, Satan. For the scriptures must be fulfilled as prophesied. Guess what? Unstoppable. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be buried on the third day. He's going to rise again. Peter, you're going to get run over by this train if you get out in front of it. Get behind me, Satan. Let me give you a second one. His name is Judas. His name is Judas. There was a prophecy that there would be one who would betray him. They didn't give his name. But there's going to be one who's going to betray him. It's going to happen. It's unstoppable. So I want to read this one to you. It's found in Mark. It's in the notes, chapter 14. In the evening, this is Jesus um, at the end, at the Lord's Supper that last night before he's captured. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the 12 disciples as they were at the table eating. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Don't read over that one. <laughs> it's unstoppable. It's unstoppable. When he says, I tell you the truth, just go on and make the deposit in the bank. It's, it's, you can't, nobody's going to stop it. I tell you the truth. One of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one? Because they knew whenever he said, I tell you the truth, I've told you the truth. So they asked him, am I the one? And Jesus replied, it is, one, it is one of you twelve who is eating from the bowl with me. Why? 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 For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. What's unchangeable? As the Scriptures declared long ago. You know what the Scriptures declared long before Jesus ever got to this room? The Son of Man will die. Can anybody stop it? Can, can the 12 guys say, let's get out of town. Sneak him out tonight. Huh? Let's get him out. Tie, somebody tie up Judas and we'll get out, right? Mm, you're not getting it. For the Son of Man must die as the Scripture to care long ago. So if it's unstoppable, if it's unstoppable, if everything prophesied, announced, I tell you the truth, is un, unstoppable, you know, it, it will happen. Look at the next sentence. But how terrible it will be for the one through whom it happens. It's for the one who does it. So here's my point tonight. In many ways, I think the culture has shifted so far it's beyond recovery. I think there's a great apostasy taking place right now, a great falling away from the Word of God. It's in the church. It is catastrophic. It will lead eventually to the coming of the Antichrist. But you better not be involved in it when it does. That's my counsel. You better not be connected to it when it comes through. Somebody's going to betray Jesus. Woe to him through which it comes. The Son of Man's going to die. These events are going to take place. You know what? Paul already prophesied that the events are going to lead up to the coming of the Antichrist before there's a great 
uh, taking caught up event. It's already written. It's going to happen. Nobody's going to stop it. I don't know the day. I know this. You better not be a part of the rebellion while the rebellion goes through town. You better get away from that rebellion. Look what he says. For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be. L listen, it gets worse. How terrible will it be for the one through whom the rebellion comes? So how terrible will it be? Look at the last, last sentence. It'd be far better if he'd never been born. I'm going to tell you what that means. I'm going to tell you what that means. Whether you know it tonight or not, I'm going to tell you what you are. You are an eternal being. You, did not, you have not always been. You had a starting point. But you will always be. You are a soul. And God breathed into you, your soul, life. And he has pushed you into eternity. He has pushed me. I'm into eternity. I'm moving into eternity. You're going to be forever somewhere. I'm going to be forever somewhere. I got a starting point. Okay? I had a beginning. I had a day that I wasn't, and the next day I was. I got a beginning. But I got no end. My soul is eternal. And here, it'd be better had you never been born to be part of the rebellion. Guess why? Guess why? There's only one answer. What would be better if you'd never been born? Because you were born, because you have a soul, because God breathed into your life and he pushed you into eternity, you're going to be forever somewhere. It'd have been better if you'd never been nowhere than you'd be in hell. Because you can't get out. So what's the summary tonight? We're surrounded every day with people who are lost. The walking dead. And if they don't find this gospel, it'd be better if they'd never been born. But it's too late. It's too late. They're already born. It'd be better if they'd never been born. Because they're lost. And they're going to be forever in the outer darkness where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we've got this news. We've got this message. We got this, we got this resurrection of the dead, forgiveness of sin, make peace with God. Jesus Christ. And the people who believe it is what it is. Good news. The most good news of all good news. Guess what they do? They share it with those who don't know about it. However you got to do it. If, if you got to start in Genesis, hallelujah. If you can jump to John, hallelujah, hallelujah. It doesn't matter. But you got to share. You got to tell them. You got to tell them. Some will, some won't. Some are going to embrace it. Some are going to call you an idiot. But there's some things that are going to take place. And they're all in the book. And they're unstoppable. Just don't associate yourself with the rebellion. Associate yourself with the Redeemer. And He is coming. You better believe it. He is coming. Father, thank you for your word. Father, we're watching a great rebellion even now in our own land. It's in the churches. And I pray, Father, for wisdom and discernment. And I pray, Father, that we would truly be the church that carries this light, the salt, into the world that's dying without you. Give us wisdom, discernment, power, strength, courage, boldness. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.